So, uh, good morning. Thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Mark Sullivan. It's my sister's partner, Neil Schwartz. We are the new owners of SBR Net, stands for Sports Business Research Network. And uh, what we have is we have a ton of data on everything from sports participation, how many pickleball players are there, how many female ice hockey players are there. We have all that type of information. I think also one of our big important parts is we have a ton of information that comes to end behavior. How do they behave? How do they engage with their team? How do they consume Dallas Cowboys licensed product? You know, all that information is on the site. We also have a ton of uh, content that we've added, including one of the newest things we've added is a podcast series called My First Job in Sports. And My First Job in Sports targets students like yourselves who in a couple of years will be looking to break into the job market. And what we do is we interview a bunch of people who are on the second or third rung of the career ladder. And uh, you'll get a sense from either watching or listening to these interviews, how they broke into the field and how they managed their career going forward. So Neil, you ready to go? Um, one that hit the glass of water. I always say that sometimes I wish I got paid by the word. Thank you, Mark. Well, yeah. So I want to thank Mark, but um, before I get started, I want to thank um, Dr. Jeremy, Dr. Lesak. I want to thank uh, Dr. Sanders. I want to thank Rick Burton. I want to thank Rodney Paul. I want to thank all the people that I have been working with because it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, you don't realize how lucky you are to be in a place like this, to be with instructors, faculty members that care so deeply and that have so much knowledge to impart. I, I, I can't tell you this summer, and I'm gonna back up after I say this, but this summer, we brought in two interns from fall school to do some work for us. You may know them. Does anybody know Preston Klaus? I see somebody shaking their head. Preston has a big presence. <laughs> he had a big presence with me too, but that's a whole other story. But um, also Alex Borelli worked for us. I don't know if any of you know Alex. It's funny, Alex seems to keep a much more low-key kind of existence. But they both worked for us this summer. And I would frequently call Mark. And then I, when I talked to um, you know, Jeremy or, or Francesco um, in, in the placement department and all that, I would always start off my conversation with this. I cannot tell you and describe into words to quantify it into how, how great and how well qualified and how well instructed and how much knowledge you, these, your, the students coming out of the school have. They are, you are all being prepared in, in what I would consider the best way possible for that first job in sports, really are. And I, mean, I, I know, you know I say that, but I do mean it. I've been, just to give you an idea, Mark and I, are, I've been in the research business 26 years. Um, I've done every kind of research pretty much that's out there, except for medical research, but not into that, not into the site of the work. Um, but I've been doing research, quantitative, qualitative, uh, consumer-based, dealer-based, POS-based, point of sale, which would be sales data. Um, you know, Mark and I have worked on a number of projects together. So I have 26 years in research, also media research. 26 years in research, 21 of them in specific sports. And when I fell into sports research, it was probably one of the best days of my life, except of course for the days my children were born and subsequently my grandchildren. I know I have grandchildren. But I love sports. Why? Sports are fun. Let's face it. Let's face it. We're not curing cancer. We're not going to solve the climate crisis. You know, we're not going to, you know, we're. All we're doing is we're making people's lives better because people love their sports, college sports, professional sports, even their kids' sports. 
you know, watching your kid on the soccer field, which I hope a lot of you have this opportunity to do at some point. But really, we love sports. Um, SBRNet is a service that is devoted to providing data and sports market analytic data to help you with your projects, with your research, but also it's there to provide you with the tools you need to better understand the fundamentals of what Dr. Lessac teaches, because it's an interesting thing. The first word in data analytics is data. If you've got no data, you've got no raw material, you cannot do the second part. It's just the way it is. Um, and, and there's a lot of different types of data. You know, we'll talk today, we we'll talk a little bit about quantitative data. Now, look, I have been doing something that um, I'm going to lecture less and try to point. I'm going to ask some questions. Okay. If you have an answer, you want to give it fine. If you don't, I'll probably just look at somebody and ask you to give me your name, where you're from, and, you know, answer the question. Nothing's that difficult. But I want to, you know, I want to get people, as many people as involved. So there's quantitative data and qualitative data. It's interesting sitting right in front of me. What's your first name? Uh, Doug. Where are you from, Doug? Cleveland. Interesting city. Well, actually, I <laughs> one of the things about Cleveland is I drove all the way from Columbus to Cleveland for a corned beef sandwich. Where at? Corky and Lane. So I am in Utah. Yeah, yeah. So you know, everybody has their thing. I have a lot of things. Mark, my my partner Mark can tell you I got a bunch of things. Um, so. But if I ask you, what, what is the difference? So to explain to me quantitative data versus qualitative data. I'm going to grab by the way my chip. Oh, uh, so quantitative data is more just numbers, more like tactile things we can see or um, calculate, how use formulas kind of do like analysis based off the numbers. But qualitative is more just like observational things like using the senses or like things like that. Qualitative data is good, bad, judgmental. How do I feel about something? Good, bad, uh, you know, taste good, doesn't taste good, qualitative. Quantitative data is all about the numbers. If you can't throw a number on it, a whole number, a percentage, a letter grade, whatever it is, if you can't throw a number, if you cannot measure it, you can't monitor it, okay? So it's quantitative, it's all about the numbers. And one of the things that I like to talk about is what we like to call data-driven decision-making. Because, you know, who are you going to trust? The analyst that walks in or the data marketing person that walks in and says, hey, I spoke to a couple of our biggest clients and they said, you know, they love product A, whatever it might be. Actually, I have that story that I told earlier about I, I probably made a, a huge mistake, but I went into a company. I'm not familiar with the brand Rawlings, R A W L I N G S. They are one of the like legacy brands in our business. You know, brands like Wilson, Rawlings, Spalding, Slazinger, and a bunch of others. Dunlop. You know, these are brands that used to be around that were like, you know, they were the Nikes of their day, but they're not really the Nikes of any day anymore. But I walked into a meeting with a, a CEO at the time of Rawlings and the director of sales. And, and I asked him, he was being a little bit pompous and he, to be honest, he was asking for it. But, and I, of course, never wanted to miss an opportunity to give somebody what they asked for. But I asked him, I said, let me ask you a question. I, I was looking at the data, looking at the quantity of data. And he, I said, you know, can you write down the top, your top five best-selling products. Now, you think you want to know, now he's a manufacturer, so they don't always know what they call sell-through. Sell-through is what we buy. Sell-in is what they sell. So there's this gap that exists between sell-in and sell-through. Because to be honest with you, it's in that gap where the money's made. Because it either sells through and you buy it and then they get another order, or it don't sell through. And guess what? That's either coming back and the, and the retailer is going to want their money back, or there's going to be something that they're going to ask for called markdown money. 
because they have to mark it down and the retailer doesn't want to get nailed with having to lose all of his margin. Excuse me. So I asked the CEO, write down the top five best selling products. I'll save you, I was gonna ask the question. He got two of the five right. Why? I asked him why, and you know why? Well, I went out on Saturday with my kid who were buying, I had to buy him something, hockey gear, something at this local, at Dick's, at Dick's Sporting Goods. And I think I was a manager and I asked him, you know, what was selling? And I asked him if this particular product was selling. And he's like, oh yeah, it's going great. You know, it's selling great. And, you know, and, you know, I looked at the reports and I'm like, well, where is it selling great? Because it really is, you know, I'm getting the sell through information here. And um, POS, point of sales data, quantitative, dollars, units, measurable, monitorable. And he, didn't, he, he was like, wow, I didn't have any idea. And you know what? Because again, data-driven decisions, in my opinion, are always better decisions. But there is a room, there, there is space for qualitative data. But I just use qualitative to confirm what I think I know confirm what my quantitative data said or refute because every once in a while some the data doesn't go as you think it will and i've had that happen too um i've had a number of situations that one recently where it didn't pass the smell test and you know if it doesn't pass the smell test and guess what you know i want to be able to you know ensure that what i'm putting out is right or i didn't have some sort of weird variable or some sort of anomaly because I will tell you right now, you are going into this sporting business in a very interesting time. Now, there's a, I, I always encourage people when they're looking at data, quantitative data, data analysis, don't look at one data point. Don't look at as grab as many as you can, trending data. How is this particular situation trending? Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it going up in a increased way? You know, is it linear going up in a linear, you know, just a linear regression? Is it going up faster or is it going down faster or vice versa? So acceleration. So you really want to make sure, but what happens? Who here knows what a black swan event is or a black swan? Anybody want to answer? How about the young lady? It's a private city, so I'm not going to find out. You know. What's a black swan or a black swan event? What's your first name? Marissa. Marissa, what? And where are you from? Colorado. What part? Um, like. I know. Well, my, my children live in uh, Rockville Center. Oh, well, I'm from Okay, Mark, grew up there. So, what's a black swan event, Marissa? Um, it would be like something like What? Like something like this. It is unique. It definitely is. Anybody want to take a shot at it? A black swan event is something that essentially never happens. Because you know what? There are no black swans. Now, there have been swans that have been painted to look black. There have been others that have been dyed black. But in, in nature, there is no black swan. So now over time, that particular trait has been genetically nature has genetically engineered that out of the species for some reason. A black swan event is something that doesn't ever happen. And we, we are just coming out of it or still in one, depending on how you look at things. So what happens when everything you thought you knew, the gentleman on the left, what's that impact? Is that what it What's your first name? Uh, my first name is Brad. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Where are you from? I'm from Maryland. What part? Like just outside of Baltimore. What part? Uh, Towson. Been there. Really? Done a lot of traveling in the sports business over There's a bunch actually, uh, uh, Fila actually is a brand that's not too far from there. And of course, Under Armour. Yeah. But what do you do when everything you thought you knew about something is wrong or is now wrong? What do you do? I go relearn it. You got to go look at things a different way because you can't look at things the same way. 
Because if you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always got. But when you do what you've always done, in this case, you're going to get the opposite of what you got. Because we are in such a black swan situation. So it's, you know, you've got to open your minds. Think about your process. When Dr. Lesak assigns an assignment or you've got, you know, you're working on some sort of analysis. Think about your process. An example, minor league baseball. You actually used this example in uh, Dr. Sanders' class. Let's say you want to look at how do I increase ticket sales for the Syracuse Mets? They're the double A, uh, I think double A franchise, double A, whatever. But they come to you, they come to Fox School and say, hey, we've got a problem. You know, after three years of declining sales, you know, we want to try to reverse the curse, reverse the trend. But we're coming out of this pandemic. How do we do it? What do we do? How do we start? Where do we go? What do we do? What questions should I be asking? What answers do I need? Well, that's where a service like ours really comes in because it gives you, in a lot of ways, a one-stop shop or a one-stop location to be able to get at various forms of data, quantitative and qualitative, but it also gives you so much more. What I like to say is, you all have access to this, to SBRNet, Sports Market Analytics. You all have access. And I cannot, in the time of body, even dare try to go through everything. But as an example, if you want to do something for minor league baseball, the first thing you need to do is. This is what we call our mega search or super search. And then what we've done is that we've made this really the best starting place. Why? Because what we've done is when you start a project, you have to have a start, you've got to have a road, a process, and then you have to have a finish. Well, where do you start? I mean, I, you know, look, I, Went to school, I sat in front of CEOs, I've been assigned, you know, Mark and I are working on a big project right now for a footwear manufacturer that I won't name on sustainability. They want to know how important sustainability is within their particular category of business. So, you know, Mark and I went through our process of determining, you know, where do we go, what are we doing with all that, but this is the process. We start by looking at as much data as we can. And I have to say, you're probably going to go through a lot of crap, you know, or a lot of you're going to kiss a lot of frogs till you get to the, the real data, the swamp that you need, or the princess that you need. But we give it to you in three forms. One, these are all relevant articles that our articles team has added to the sports market analytics site. So what we've done is that we have determined what are those sports publications that will provide you with some good foundational information. And by the way, the list of all of the available sports publications are, where is this? Resource Center? Yes. Uh, no, that's ours. Um, it's not new stand. Thanks. So if you're not sure what are the important publications, go to the SBR Net site or go to Sports Market Analytics and look at all of the different publications that are out there. You know, whether it's if you're interested in the sport of running or you're running on the running business. Running Insight, which used to come from Mark's former company. But we've got things like The Analyst, you know, Axio Sports, they do a tremendous job. One of my favorites is Sports, Sports Money Playbook, because let's face it, when it comes to the business of sports and the business world, 
you know, for it. But we've got all of these different hashtag sports, all of these different services. But what we've done is we have actually been able to cherry pick what we believe are the best articles. Let's go back to our search. So again, we're looking at relevant articles. This is just me, okay? It may not be you. Your process might be complete. And I will tell you the one thing is, I need you all to try to avoid skipping to the end because a lot of people love to do that. They're like, this is BS. I'm going right to minor league attendance and I'm going to start there. Try to resist that temptation as best you can. Try to resist. You know, it's like you're going to a destination. You know, try to resist. Follow the route. We give you articles, relevant research. So, for instance, I'm going to skip the game, but um, looking for minor league attendance figures. Well, I'm going to actually do something else. Shoot for a trip. This actually comes from our data. Every year, we do a rather large survey of fans. And this year, we had a, in the middle of our Black Swan event, we had a unique situation. Yes, yes. Oh, thanks. Thank you. So, one of the questions that we asked this year, and this is a minor base, what would it take to get you to come back to games? What's it going to take? Is it going to take getting vaccinated? If you're 44.5% of the cases, that's exactly what they say it's going to take. But look at some of the other options that also show up pretty high. Special promotions. Of course, rigor is clean. Look at some of the other things that aren't as important. You know, a lot of people are making a big deal about, you know, contactless transactions. You know what? For spans of minor league baseball, not a big deal. It's not a big deal to don't focus on. So you really want to understand, you know, what are those aspects, you know, before you start diving into attendance figures, because that data is also here. Um, okay, let's see here, money attendance. Basketball. It's in the uh, single sport summaries. Is it? Is it? Is it? There's so much data you got in this. It's kind of ironic to someone who actually organized it. So before you start diving into attendance figures, before you start diving into media, before you start diving into sports gambling, streaming media, gaming play, all of the other things that go into making up a sports fan. Question, and you can be honest, I do not know your parents. How many of you gamble on sports events online or in person? I swear to you, I don't know any of your family. So how many of you have, um, so how do I want to put this? I don't know how to put it. Which, just out of curiosity, which services do you like? How many are using uh, DraftKings? Anybody? How many are using points pay? Anybody? How many are using, what's the one I always forget? FanDuel. FanDuel. None of them are legal. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter. Nobody doesn't matter. Jeremy, people are still using the The offshore stuff, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. Look, I, you know, it's a nice thing. Right now, 22 states out of 50 have legalized um, sports gambling, and of those 22, most of them are in some phase of what they call operational. So either they are. Um, limited to brick and mortar right now, or they're limited to some other situation. But 
There are 22 states. I suspect it will never be legalized in all 50 states. Why? I do not know. But and, and we did a uh, and we did a report on that. So again, understand your process. Does any Jeremy how much time we have? Oh, I'm sorry, about seven minutes. So, By the way, look at that picture. It's me, my sophomore year. I, I went to Syracuse. It's marvelous. <laughs> so when I'm, when I'm thinking about a project, I'm always trying to answer questions. And for me, it's all about the ones that are up on the screen right now. It's all about who. It's all about what. It's all about when, where, why, how. you got to answer the questions, guys. Because if you can't answer the questions, you can't pass go and collect $200. Literally. These are the waypoints that you go on when you're trying to solve a, a strategic problem. Look, there's a lot more I can talk about, um, and I do, but there's a couple things I really want to get to also. Number one is that, look, I know a lot of you um, over the year, you know, the, over your education will be working on a number of projects, a uh, number of things. Look, a lot of people say, Give me a call, I'll help you out and all that. I really will. Um, I would prefer if you email me. Um, you know, if you say, look, I'm a you know, where where should I go? What data should I be looking at? What's a good, you know, what's a good plan? Um, and I'm always happy to provide, you know, some suggestions. I'm also, if, if it gets a little deeper, I'm also happy to have a phone call. But if you've got a question about data or where do I, you know, what do I get it? What do I do? But don't. Just call me without having done a little bit of your own homework, going on the site, doing a little bit of tracking. The other thing is that Mark and I really want to see everyone here get a job in sports. And there's no reason why, but there are so many different jobs. I really suggest, Jeremy, how do I uh, zoom out a little bit? Uh, to make it small, just tell me. Uh, control minus minus. Okay, I'm a Mac guy. So, Mark and I, when we first bought the company, the one thing that came up universally was hey, can you help our students get jobs in sports? We're not an employment service. But what we did was we came up with this web series that includes both audio and video called My First Job in Sports. There are so many different ways to get that first job in sports, but you need that first job to get the second, third, and fourth job. And a lot of you, while you'd love to go to work for the New York Mets or you know, the Yankees or Green Bay Packers or Pittsburgh Steelers or anything, it's just not likely to happen. It's just not likely to happen. But what is more likely to happen is like some of these folks would be Peter Kopp, you know, did some research uh, with a company called Stacks Perform. What do they do? They collect statistics and player statistics and team statistics and then sell them to the media mostly and also sponsorship folks. So what do they need? They need analysts to help organize the data, visualize the data. Alex Hickey. Alex actually is a friend of Mark's. Mark, tell Alex a story. Yeah, so Alex is the daughter of my wife's best friend, uh, was a high school athlete, was a softball player. And ended up going to American and uh, got the first job with uh, a sports agency and uh, you know, doing events and, and interacting with the public. You know, when you show up at a uh, uh, Washington Nationals game, there are these young people in the aisle sort of gathering your email and promoting a bank or a car deal or something like that. That's what Alice did. But she's parlayed that into a job at MLS making soccer. And then recently um, landed a job with uh, PointsBet, which is, I think, an Australian based publicly traded gambling company. And she's, you know, her third or fourth job, she's got a pretty good job making pretty good money. And now, anybody who's been following along with what's going on in the sports gambling business, if you look on LinkedIn, I don't know if you're on LinkedIn, but if you're not, you should be. 
there were, I think I counted 16, I would say, entry level jobs within the sports gambling world, looking for analysts, looking for you know, marketing managers, looking for people that are in that entry level, first level, even second level in some cases. It is just an incredibly growing field. And while sports gambling might, you know, you might say, look, it might, might turn your stomach. Look, everybody has, you know, a set of, you know, I understand ethics and morals, and what makes you you. But if, you know, if it doesn't, you know, it's a really good business right now. Um, to be in. And a lot of Jeremy, Jeremy and I were talking about it last night. In a lot of ways, right now, it's the Wild West because, you know, things are just getting kind of solidified and rules are being, I mean, literally, they are making rules up on the fly. So, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity. Sports commissions. Every one of you probably comes from a city where they have a convention and visitors bureau. I mean, it's part of the convention and visitors bureau, they have something called the sports commission. What a great place to get your start because that's really in a lot of ways where the rubber meets the road and you can really get that good, good, good first start and also start using your analytic skills that you're learning, you know, in this class with Dr. Losak. And also if you're with, uh, you know, Shane, Sa Dr. Sanders and, and, and Rick and, you know, and Rodney Paul and uh, all the others. So, there's so many opportunities out there. You're in a wonderful field. I will tell you firsthand why am I in it? Because it's fun. Sports are fun. We're not talking life and death. We're not gonna cure cancer. We're not gonna cure climate change. We're just not. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna make people's lives better to give them fun. And we're gonna have fun doing it. And that's really why you're in sport. Just remember that every morning when you wake up and, you know, look, you're going to have some mornings where you're going to not want to get out of I, I went to Syracuse. I know what the weather's like here. You know, I know firsthand, you know, with, and, and when I went to school, believe me, you, you've got a lot more better, better footwear, better, you know, better outerwear, better at everything. But I, you know, I can't tell you how many days I walked and I had snow in my boots and was cursing, you know, an eight o'clock class that I had to take because I couldn't, you know, I had to take it and I couldn't find any other option. We're all lucky. You're lucky to be in a wonderful place at a wonderful time being taught by wonderful people. I hope they invite Mark and I back. Um, we'd love to speak again. Um, I, I, and also two things. Number one is that we hired uh, two Syracuse interns over last summer. Um, we will do the same. Those interns will actually most likely graduate to the next level project that we're working. We're working on a much larger project, which we'll be talking about later today. If you're interested in all, it might be worth 30 minutes of your time because it might be, you might be involved in something that, you know, will change, not our industry forever, I'll never say that, but you will work on something that people will be, we think people will be talking about in the coming years and your name could be associated with it. So I want to thank you all for your time. I want to thank you all for your attention. And I want to thank Dr. Lesak again for inviting us. Uh, again, we've been up on Thursday. Expect another email from me about the module, uh, just clarifying kind of some deadline stuff. And again, if you're interested in working on that SPR and that project or at least writing more, definitely show up that interest in later. Then you need to do your email boxes. So uh, all that there. I hope to see you guys later. Thank you. Thank you.